Am I sharing my screen? Yes, I am. And good morning. This is now week seven, Tuesday, November 23rd. Uh, happy Thanksgiving. And what's due today, of course, all week six items. So task six, discussion six, and lesson six. What are we doing this week? So for week seven, we are doing the respiratory system, uh, chapter 22. And let's see, ATP structure, respiratory gas exchange, and oxygen carbon dioxide transport. So essentially, while we're loading up our uh, open stacks here, the chapter 22, respiration. Now, we already mentioned that in order to live, you need uh, oxygen. You also need glucose. And now from our previous lectures, we now totally understand why. Because remember, glucose plus oxygen equals uh, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. It is the metabolic fuel that powers this engine called the human being. So I need to breathe. And if I'm not breathing very well, then that's a problem. Therefore, there needs to be gas exchange. Just like anything in the world, like if I put gas in my gas tank, I'm gonna have an exhaust, right? I put gasoline in my car and then I'm gonna have an exhaust, uh, you know, in your typical, in your, you know, typical gas powered vehicle, right? So my fuel, well, the thing that's going to make me fuel is oxygen. And of course, the thing that I have to get rid of is the gas carbon dioxide that is considered a waste product. So oxygen, we inhale, carbon dioxide, we exhale. That is one form of respiration. And that's what respiration really means. It means gas exchange. Now, if we're looking at this picture right here of our lungs, the air on the outside or the atmospheric air into the lungs, that's one form of gas exchange, okay? I inhale oxygen and I exhale carbon dioxide. Now we're gonna look at other gas exchange, like at the level of uh, inside your lungs, at the level of the kind of like at the microscopic level, that's also gas exchange because oxygen has to go in to my bloodstream somehow. And we're gonna talk about how exactly it does that. And it has, the carbon dioxide has to get out of my bloodstream, bloodstream uh, because it's waste. If I build up too much carbon dioxide, I'll build up too much uh, hydrogen ion, I'll become acidotic, and that's never a good thing. And we'll talk about the reasons why that's not a good thing. And lastly, of course, we talked about ATP, and we know that ATP is in the mitochondria, so that cellular, that's cellular respiration can even go even smaller. The gas exchange in between the cells and the, uh, and the outside world. So oxygen has to go in, carbon dioxide, and ATP has to come out. So you look at those like, those are forms of respiration and the respiratory system facilitates that. And if you look at this overview of the respiratory system, it's divided into two sections. You have your upper respiratory tract, which is everything from the trachea on up and the lower respiratory tract, which is the trachea on down. Upper respiratory tract infections include things like rhinitis, which is your nasal cavity, uh, pharyngitis, which is your throat, you have a little bit inflammation infection of your pharynx, laryngitis, inflammation or infection of here, your cartilaginous structures here that form your voice box. So those things, yeah, it's annoying, you feel sick. Even sinusitis, there's holes up here in your skull, little rooms there to make your skull light. And um, that, that too is considered an upper respiratory tract infection. So try not to pass off a note to your boss saying that you have a URTI, especially if your boss is medical, they're gonna look at you and say, so what, right? But what is of particular danger when that stuff progresses down south, inferiorly here? So you have tracheitis and a whole bunch of other like pneumonia, bronchitis, any itis that's down here, that's a little bit more serious. Well, to be honest, a lot more serious. So when 
um, when an infection progresses down into the lower respiratory tract and have a lower respiratory tract infection, that means everyone, everything from the trachea on down, that is of considerable issue and problem, okay? What are the structures here that are nice to notice here? You have this thin, uh, if you recall your, um, oh, well, you haven't done it yet. Um, when you cut up the pig, there's gonna be a very thin muscle here, and that's your diaphragm, and we're gonna talk about that, uh, its importance uh, to um, uh, how you actually breathe. You, of course, have your uh, lungs covered by your uh, rib cage or your thoracic cage here, here in this area called your thorax. Uh, you could also see that the right and left lung are a little bit different, right? You also have the trachea, which has cartilaginous rings. They are C-shaped, meaning to say is they only cover the front, and we're going to talk about why. This bifurcation here, or this crossroads, if you will, um, this is called your carina. It separates your trachea into your right and left main stem bronchus, and that too has differences as well. So that belief that, uh, I don't know, well, I guess it was my belief when I was a kid that left and right are symmetrical, they're not. Uh, and you guys know that if you've ever stared into a mirror and uh, covered like half your face and then you mirror your face, it looks bizarre. So, uh, but there is a right and there's a left and there's differences, okay? So know the difference between upper respiratory and lower respiratory. Now they say this word conducting zone. Now, everything from the trachea on up uh, in the department of pulmonology or pulmonary medicine, they, we call that the dead space. It's not really dead, but there's no actual um, uh, gas exchange going on. But here at the lower levels of the lungs, those are the conducting zones. And that's why a lower respiratory tract infection is much more dangerous than an upper. Because the upper, okay, my nose gets stuffed up. I still can breathe through my mouth. You know, I got a sore throat. I still can breathe. My larynx, you know, I can't talk. I, I experience aphonia, right? When you can't talk, you know, I talk like that. That's uh, laryngitis. So um, it's not deadly. You're not going to die. But if you see, there's the only one tube on the way down. If you have tracheitis or anything goes on here or in the lower respiratory uh, conducting zones, that is a problem, okay? So let's look at the upper respiratory. You have, of course, your nasal bone and your nasal cartilage, uh, also known as your septal cartilage. A septum is something that separates anything from a left and a right. And uh, here, the cartilage has to be, you can't have bone because if it's, uh, if it's not flexible, all the mucus that uh, that we're gonna about to talk about, it's gonna stuff everything up and it's gonna gum everything up. So whoever created us, created us pretty smart. So these holes are called your nares, N-A-R-E-S, also known as your nostrils, okay? And they're separated from a left or right and there's cartilage here. And then it then transitions to a bone, which is here. Now, when you look at your, uh, your nose, it has these uh, conche. And uh, uh, what's a conch? You know, like a, like a shell, uh, you know, a conch shell. It has these, like these little flares that stick out. Uh, if you've ever seen, you know, these, one of these big shells on the beach. And uh, they form these shelves. And again, all of this is covered in mucus. And we already know the mucosal lining and the, uh, the respiratory epithelia, it's really important that we have a mucosal lining because uh, there's the 250 some odd horrible things that floating around in this room right now. But who captures the majority of that? Another thing that your uh, upper respiratory does as well, it, because since it's moist and since you're a warm human being, it kind of uh, warms up and, um, and uh, humidifies the air which also will be conducive to breathing. But you can see here if, you know, you get punched in the nose or you, uh, you got a really stuffed up nose that you won't be able to uh, breathe too well through your nose, right? Well, 
Another thing that people use their nose for is cocaine and heroin and uh, uh, Xanax. A lot, a lot of stupid people in this world. I used to be one of them, right? That, you know, you do stuff. And they snort these chemicals because if you see here, this is the cribriform plate, which is part of your ethmoid bone. Right here, there are nerves that are coming for, from directly from your brain and your brain sits up right here. So that's not a good thing. Well, it's a good thing if you're like into cocaine, but that's why when they snort it, they immediately get that high because it goes right up there. And also there are blood vessels here as well. Imagine that powder, which is an abrasive substance or even uh, a crushed Xanax pill. It's gonna pound on this and then eventually wear this away. And then that's why they have nosebleeds and things of that matter, right? Um, so you could see how your olfactory sense is right there. That's why when you smell something and you need that aqueous environment and we're gonna, uh, that humidified environment. Uh, if anyone, any of you ever been in the desert, uh, I had the uh, wonderful uh, fortune or misfortune to, to be deployed in the desert. Um, I once was standing on a big pile of ca camel dung and I couldn't smell a thing. But the second I went inside the barracks, which is, um, 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 you know, uh, at least, uh, you know, there's some air conditioning. Uh, then everyone was like, ah, oh, what's that smell? I was walking around that thing for hours because it's in a dry environment. Now, of course, definitely you have saliva and things here, and this is your oral cavity. And of course your tongue is a nice little muscle here, but what's important that you also can breathe through your mouth and you have here your oropharynx, and here's your pharynx, which is your, um, your, your throat. Then it proceeds down to a set of these cartil cartilage plates and a, kind of like these cartilage folds. And that's your larynx, uh, also known as your voice box. You also have thyroid and cricoid cartilages as well uh, here to also protect your trachea. And this is the beginning parts of your trachea, okay? And you have the wonderful cartilage here, and that's your epiglottis. Now, the function of the epiglottis is if I'm eating, and this is my esophagus right here, posterior located, let's say I, I'm eating or drinking, right? In essence, when I eat or drink, I am momentarily holding my breath. And how do I do that? The epiglottis shuts down, and then the food and or water goes down this pipe. And then I continue to talk after I swallow, this epiglottis comes back up and I need air to get these vocal folds going, okay? Um, and that means you shouldn't eat and speak at the same time. You shouldn't drink and speak at the same time. You're going to confuse this epiglottis and then accidentally some of that stuff is gonna go down here. It's gonna, uh, some of the food or water will go down into your trachea and then it will elicit a gag response and then you'll start coughing stuff up. Oh, and a little, just a little also side note for all you people interested in surgery and anesthesia. It's the reason why you have NPO or non -per orum, nothing by mouth, 24 hours prior to your surgery. Because if there's anything in your stomach, one of the major side effects of, of anesthesia is vomiting. And uh, actually the major side effects of any narcotic is vomiting. So just imagine you're semi-conscious or you're unconscious, you vomit, all that vomitus comes up here and then might go into your trachea. Then you get asp uh, aspirational pneumonia and that's never a good thing. And it's very hard to, uh, Hard to manage. Hard, we don't like to say the word cure because remember, we're not gods or goddesses. I don't cure you like some magic stick. I manage your case. I manage your health with the use of knowledge of anatomy, physiology, pathology, and so forth. Now, again, a quick, a quick review of the microscopic view of your epithelia or your lining of your respiratory tract. It is pseudostratified columnar. So they look like columns. And do you have these things that look like, you know, like uh, champagne flutes and they're called goblet cells. And remember, goblet cells make the mucus. The mucus then lines all of this. 
all the stuff from the air that the, the mucus uh, traps gets pushed away and pushed out, up and out by your cilia. That's why when you cough or when you sneeze or when you blow your nose, make sure you do it into a tissue paper, fold it up, and then, of course, uh, discard it. Especially your older patients might like the use of, um, of uh, um, you know, um, what do you call it? handkerchiefs, right? Uh, my uh, my grandfather and my father and my father-in-law, they're all from that generation, love that. And of course, beware of children because what do they like doing? They like putting it on their sleeves and anything else that they can touch. So that becomes a point source of infection. Here's another beautiful picture of your nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx, all part of your upper respiratory tract. Here is a lovely view of your thyroid or thyroid cartilage. And of course, your epiglottis is a little flap. You're going to see that in, um, in our dissection. And if you look at here, these are your tracheal cartilage and they are C-shaped, meaning they cover the sides and the front, but they don't cover the back. And remember, we mentioned this tube right here that's in the back. That's your esophagus. You can see how it's like flattened and it only, and it has to expand when you drink water or eat food. And the only way it can do that is uh, if the cartilage didn't wrap all the way around. So if the cartilage doesn't cover the posterior section of your trachea, then your esophagus back here can expand. Here are your uh, tracheal um, or um, what's a better way to, uh, your, your vocal cords. Now your vocal cords, they're, they're like these little ligaments and they're, they're, very, they're very thin and fine. And that's why you, when you speak uh, or sing or yell, um, they vibrate. But again, they're, these folds are connected to muscles. So if you overuse it, that's why if ever you, uh, you um, ever um, listen to any drill instructors, uh, I don't know about other services, but the Marine Corps, all of them have, I don't know, it sounds like they all have uh, like throat cancer. Yeah, I'll talk like this, like a frog. Because imagine yelling all day. Uh, the younger DIs, not so much, but uh, the old hats, uh, woof. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk like this. What are you doing, Marine? And it's just, it, to this day, it gives me the shivers. So let's look at this trachea. Of course, your larynx, it's a, a, a cartilage, and then it's continuous here with your trachea is C-shaped uh, um, cartilaginous rings. And you'll see the cartilage continues on down to your right and left, the main stem bronchus, and into your bronchioles. But you could see little by little by little, the cartilage starts going away. The further you get into the lung, the less cartilage, and then the cartilage gets placed, replaced by smooth muscle. And remember, smooth muscle or visceral muscle, you can't really control. Now, this is, of course, this carina. This is the, the bifurcation or crossroads of your uh, trachea. So it splits into two, into your right lung and your left. You will also notice the right lung or the right main stem bronchus is fatter, like wider, and it's more vertical. And the left main stem bronchus doesn't have that you know, uh, easy angle. It's a, uh, uh, the angle is a little bit sharper and it's a little bit thinner. Now, why do I point this out? Because if you have foreign body, let's say like pneumoconiosis, which is like, um, you know, uh, like coal miners lung, like if you get like dust and debris, uh, let's say um, I had a patient worked in a shipyard for 30 years and had pneumoconiosis because there was asbestos Pneumoconiosis, asbestosis, coal miners lung, they all belong to the same family. Well, all those years breathing in that stuff and, and he worked there in the 60s and 70s. So yeah, who got affected first and more severely, the right lung versus left because of uh, just how the um, right main stem bronchus is shorter and fatter. So dust and whatnot, more tenly and foreign body tend to fall that way. That's a nice uh, trivia question if ever you take your MCAT 
which is your medical college aptitude or assessment test. I forgot what the A stand for. So what is all of this leading into? This is definitely a respiratory zone. And you could see at the terminal bronchial, OLE o -L -E means it's the bronchus, the really small parts of the bronchus, you're gonna get these bunches of grapes. And in Latin, that's called an alveolus or your alveolar sac. You'll notice that there is uh, um, uh, pulmonary arteries are colored blue because they're deoxygenated. If you recall your anatomy and physiology from your heart and pulmonary veins are oxygenated and they're colored red. You could see here, it's kind of, well, some books they call it like purplish. This is exactly where gas exchange occurs. That's why this is called a respiratory zone. That's, uh, that's why lower respiratory tract infections are dangerous because if I mess with the exact place where I'm going to do gas exchange between my, uh, uh, my pulmonary artery and pulmonary vein, that's a big problem. And you can see here, there is no more cartilage to keep these tubes open. There's only smooth muscle. And the reason why there's smooth muscle, let's say foreign body got down to this level, my smooth muscle will start squeezing so that all the nastiness doesn't end up in my alveolar sac, which is not good, okay? And this alveolar sac, that houses all the capillaries for um, gas exchange. So if I ask you, where's gas, where gas exchange occur? Deep within um, um, the lung, at the end of the terminal, terminal bronchial, at this alveolar sac. And you can see here, there's all capillaries right here. And again, lovely question. I could point at this and uh, your exam is in color. I could ask you, what is this? And you'll tell me it's a pulmonary artery. And then I'll ask you, what's this? It's in red, that's your pulmonary vein. Because remember, the pulmonary artery is going away from your right ventricle into your lungs. It's bringing deoxygenated blood so that I can do what? <sighs> Exhale that carbon dioxide. When I <sighs> inhale that oxygen, what happens? It goes into my pulmonary vein and then it goes back to the left atrium and then the cycle starts all over again. Watch that video of the cardiac cycle uh, you know, with the box diagram, that I can tell you right now that instead of memorizing, that totally, totally saved my academic life. You could also see here microscopically how thin everything is and how open everything is. Well, there's some cells that are responsible for that. Now you got squamous cells as type one alveolar cell, but the one that's really important to us to keep all these spaces nice and open, and they're only like single cell thick. So um, oxygen and carbon dioxide can easily go in and out of there, which is really neat. And is this cell called alveolar cell type two? That's this. And they secrete, right, pulmonary surfactant. Surfactant is important because we use that to monitor newborns, especially uh, premature babies. I was born at what, six and a half months. I was in an incubator for about five more months after that. I had absolutely no surfactant. So if I had no surfactant, what happens to all these spaces? They collapse and then they can't breathe, right? That's why uh, my APGAR score was a little bit on the low side when I was a baby, when I was a uh, newborn, um, uh, because I'm not getting the oxygen I need because pulmonary surfactant, it provides surface tension. Now, what's surface tension? Have you ever seen those pictures of, uh, instead of me just talking about it, let me just show you. Surfactant provides surface tension to water. And if you've ever noticed, like maybe you've seen this picture before, this is water. And this is like, I don't know, some bug or some mosquito. Do you see how like water forms like a kind of skin right here? That's surface tension. And that key, and, and uh, because of surface tension and alveolar type two cells and the chemical surfactant, it keeps all of these spaces open, which is pretty neat. 
And again, we utilize that for, um, we monitor newborns and, and also we also give them um, uh, medications that enhance, uh, enhance surfactant. I think we, did we ever make surfactant? I, I can't remember. I can't remember my neonatology protocols. All I remember was during neonatology is that I couldn't sleep. I'm doing CPR on babies no bigger than my than the palm of my hand. And it's the irony. Uh, I have a picture. I have a picture of me at uh, as a newborn. My father held me in the palm of my hand because uh, they actually gave me last rites twice because they thought uh, Actually, there's some people in my mother's province who thought I died. So a couple of years ago, I went back uh, to my mother's province just to see how it is. And they were all like freaked out and they were like, eh, I thought you died. I'm like, eh, no such luck. Uh, da, 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 whoa, oh, whoa, whoa, what's going on here? Okay. So let's look at the lung. Look at our buddy, the lung. And remember, there's differences between the uh, right and uh, left mainstem bronchus. And we already uh, have that. You have your carina right here. And if you look at the, um, the right lung, it's different and has a different shape. It's also separated into one, two, three sections, superior, middle, and inferior lobe. But the left lung is only uh, separated into superior lobe and inferior lobe. Hmm. And it has this bump in here, and this is where your heart belongs, hence the term cardiac notch. That's right here. Okay, so I could point at this, and you can tell me what's what, right? So if I say something like, um, our patient has um, small cell lung carcinoma, middle lobe, do I have to say that it's right? No, because the only one that has a middle lobe is this one. But if I say, um, uh, oat cell carcinoma, inferior lobe, I have to do what? Distinguish right versus left, okay? And the neat thing why whoever made us made these lobes, it's like the same way that you, you make, uh, you know, the different rooms in a submarine or a modern boat. So let's say I got cancer here in the superior, superior, ro superior lobe right. Ugh, say that eight times fast, right? Well, right, of course, correct. Let's say I have it here. Whoever built us built us smart. It's kind of like a barrier so that um, a cancer or whatever craziness that's going on here, it's hard for it to cross over there. And that's why we can do things like a lobectomy. Like let's say um, I've got cancer here. I could, I could take out this portion of the lung and my patient still can have the ability to breathe. Blood supply, we already mentioned, remember, it's pulmonary circulation, it is backwards. Um, of course, parasympathetic nervous system, right? Um, does bronchoconstriction. Uh, and of course, sympathetic nervous system is bronchodilation. You don't have to sit and memorize that. Think about it. If sympathetic nervous system or fight or flight, if you're in a fight or if you're running away from a, you know, I don't know, dangerous pit bull, very angry partner, you know, whatever your situation may be, um, you're gonna need oxygen. So of course your bronchus will dilate. And if I'm just relaxing and chilling, do I really need that oxygen? Nah, so I'll have bronchoconstriction, okay? So pulmonary plexus, that a plexus is like a network of nerves. So anytime you see the word plexus, that's, uh, that's nerves. Uh, or a network of nerves, okay? So, hmm, let's, what's the next thing they want us to talk about? Ah, the covering of the lungs. There is a covering of your lungs, it's called your pleura. You have two layers with a potential space in the middle. The outer layer is called the parietal layer, and of course the guts or inside layer is called your visceral pleura. In between is a potential space that has fluid. And just like the pericardium of your heart, its function is to uh, um, um, facilitate the lubrication and also protection of your lungs. And that's called your pleura. So if you have pleuritis, that's eh, not a good thing. Or pleurisy. Pleurisy is when you have, um, you ever like uh, have a really bad cough and it feels like you're, 
your every time you cough, you're like your sternum it gets really, really irrit irritable, like your sternum is on fire. Well, if any of that fluid gets irritated, it's going to start rubbing, and then you'll get something called a pleuritic rub, and it's all these things. But uh, you could see how our lungs are very important that just like our heart has to have a double walled protective layer. But again, pus can get in there, foreign body, a whole bunch of things. Okay. Again, here's another picture of your diaphragm and a picture of your intercostal muscles. Now, your two main muscles of, uh, of respiration are your diaphragm, which is the flat muscle here, and your intercostal muscles, the muscles in between your rib cage. And if you notice your rib cage, this is bone, bone, bone. And of course, all this is cartilage so that it will allow your um, thoracic cage to expand up and out. Okay, next concept. So how do I breathe? Man. Well, you breathe because of something called Boyle's Law. This guy Boyle figured out that there's relationships between pressure and volume, okay? So this is what Boyle figured out. He figured out that there is an inverse relationship between pressure and volume. What does that mean? It means if volume increases, right, the molecules that bounce around here will have less pressure because you have more room. But if I start squeezing, if volume decreases, right, the pressure increases. So that is what is called an inverse relationship between pressure and volume. So when one increases, the other one has to decrease. Doesn't that sound like a beautiful physiology question? Hint, hint. So how do you breathe? Okay. Now, uh, if you're going for your MCAT or your NCLEX, you're, event you're eventually going to have to memorize all these. But for my course, don't. So let's copy this image. And uh, let me draw. Let's draw stuff. Okay. So um, atmospheric pressure, okay? Now, how do you breathe? How do you inhale? Uh, let's... So how do I inhale? How do I, uh, let's red for oxygen, right? How does air come from here, the outside? How does it then go inside? Okay. Now, if you recall diffusion, diffusion states that all gases and all things and all molecules go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Okay. We're all agreed to that. Well, what happens? with my diaphragm right here, starts contracting, and then it pulls this lung lungs down, and it starts drawing it down. What it will do is it will create a negative pressure, right? So if you look here, there's a negative pressure here in your transpulmonary pressure. There's a negative pressure here in your intrapulmonary pressure. So when I draw this down like a syringe, the pressure in my lungs becomes more negative. Now your atmospheric pressure, which is pretty much one atmosphere, which is 760 millimeters per mercury, your at from atmospheric pressure when you start inhaling is positive. When you start inhaling, and that means your diaphragm goes out. So right now, put your hand on your tummy, the anatomical term in your tum-tum, right? Or uh, more specifically, uh, upper, ab upper abdomen uh, around your epigastric area. Now, take a deep breath. What did you notice happened to your stomach? It should do what? Rise a little bit. What else did you notice about your chest? It went up 
and out. So if I have a greater pressure here, right? I mean, a, a greater volume. I am creating a massive amount of volume. What's going to happen to the pressure? It is going to be the inverse. It's going to become negative. It's the reason why when you pull back on a syringe, it sucks up the water, okay? So when you inhale, and let's write this in big words, inhalation, you're going to need your diaphragm. And also you're going to need, as we just demonstrated, your intercostal muscles. Doesn't that look like a beautiful both A and B question? Which muscles are involved upon inhalation? Which are the respiratory muscles of inhalation? A, diagram, diaphragm, B, intercostal muscles. C, both, D, neither. So I'm, I'm almost spelling out my, my, my final, which all of you should ace, as in A. So positive pressure on the outside, we're creating a negative pressure, right? My diaphragm bottoms out, my chest goes up and out, and increase, it increases the volume. And according to Boyle's law, if I increase the volume, I go, I'm going to decrease pressure. And I decrease the pressure to the point where it's negative. And according to the laws of diffusion, positive atmospheric pressure, negative uh, uh, lung pressures, what's gonna happen? Air is going to go in. And what do I want? I want O2, oxygen. I want it to go in. Now, what happens the exact opposite happens in uh, exhalation, right? What happened to you exhale? So you take a deep breath. There's a point where you can't inhale anymore. And then what happens? The pressure is going to build up here. So I'm going to have a greater positive pressure here. Of course, when I exhale. So it's going to be greater than the atmospheric. Therefore, I'm going to exhale. Whoa, that was almost a perfect E. Exhale. I'm doing this purely on a Mac mouse. So uh, save your applause till after this is done. Yay, exhale. And what am I exhaling? Carbon dioxide. Look at that. Now you know exactly how you breathe, right? So what things could mess it up? Well, muscles require nerves, right? Nerves require a brain. I mess up my brain, I mess up the nerves, I mess up my muscles, we're gonna have a problem. I won't be able to breathe. Even though we're only talking about the respiratory uh, uh, system, remember all systems don't exist in a vacuum. They are all cousins of each other. What else could mess me up? I could have a blockage here somewhere. I could have a blockage in the upper respiratory tract, right? Uh, what else could mess me up? Just a whole bunch of things. Uh, how about if I had a lot of mucus because I'm sick? That's gonna mess up this tubing, isn't it? What if my I had a neurologic that's squeezing all my, um, um, my visceral or smooth muscle that's in here? That's a problem. So this is exactly how you breathe. And if you notice, inhalation is active. It requires muscles. Exhalation is passive. You just, all you have to do is just let go. Now, another thing that could mess this up, let's say I had a knife. Uh, I love telling this story. I was, uh, I was in EMS and I had two sisters and they were cooking and they got into a heated argument while they were cooking. And the one sister had a knife in her hand and well, she claimed she didn't mean it. She turned around to make a point and the other sister was uh, wanted to get in her face. I don't know, that's how, 
that's how, how it was told to me when I interviewed uh, one of the sisters. Uh, when she turned around, she poked her sister in between one of the intercostal spaces, um, her uh, seventh intercostal space, which is really neat because it was too low. Uh, it wouldn't uh, hit the, the heart or anything like that. Uh, punctured her, I believe, on the left side, uh, seventh or eighth intercostal space. So, foom. What happens when there's equalization of both pressures? If there's equalization of both pressures, if the outside pressure equals the inside pressure, guess what? Can you breathe? Nope, because there has to be a pressure gradient, right? Remember Boyle's law, remember it goes uh, um, uh, the physics of diffusion. So if I poke a hole in here, right, with a knife, what's gonna happen? This lung is going to collapse and that's a bad thing. It's a very bad thing because then it won't do its job because there's no pressure gradient, no pressure gradient, Say goodbye to breathing. Okay. Um, I always get requests for this picture. So, you know what? I will save this. Uh, let's call it inhale. Uh, this is MED 110. Let's call it waiting to exhale. Wonderful move, by the way. And I'll have that available on your on your uh, model. Okay, so that's how it works. And there's of course physical factors. Force is any change of pressure divided by resistance. And remember that uh, what resistance could there be? There could be resistance to stretch. There could be resistance to pressures. There could be also um, uh, the pressure could change because uh, maybe there's a whole bunch of mucus gumming up all your tubes or there's a whole um or your um your visceral muscle remember all the uh, muscles in the inside of your lungs they could start squeezing too and that's not a good thing and here's the thing that we were talking about inhalation or inspiration diaphragm contracts pulls it draws it down interco uh external intercostal muscles go out and up and then the exact opposite is what relaxation there This thing, if ever you're going to, uh, let's see what's going on. If ever you're going to uh, take your MCAT or your NCLEX, you'll need to memorize all these volumes. And, um, and there's mathematics involved as well. But when you look at this, here's your normal breathing right now, not putting too much effort. That's your tidal volume. It's around eh, 500, 400 cc's. Then you have your expiratory reserve volume. So am I breathing? As I'm breathing, I can inhale a little bit more. Okay. Now your oh, oh sorry, that's your inspiratory reserve volume, right? Right here. Now I could be talking and having my normal tidal volume right here, but then there's a little bit more left in my lung to exhale, and that's my expiratory reserve volume. And then whatever left I have in my lung, that's called residual volume. Now, your inspiratory reserve volume, tidal volume, and expiratory reserve volume equals your vital capacity. That's your IRV plus TV plus ERV. And that's exactly how pulmonologists talk, right? So IRV, TV plus ERV equals vital capacity. Inspiratory capacity, of course, is your tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve volume. Um, and of course, all these volumes put together is total lung capacity. So they ask you questions like, what happened? It goes, what will happen with the total lung capacity if my IRV fell by 20%, blah, blah, blah. They, they have questions like that. But for my class, the only thing that you need to know is normal speaking, normal breathing pattern, tidal volume. Anything extra that I can inspire, that's your inspiratory reserve volume or your IRV. Anything that I can expire that's extra, that's your ERV or expiratory reserve volume. And then of course, anything a little bit left in my lungs, that's called residual, uh, residual volume, okay? Um, it's nice to know for my exam, but if you're taking MCAT, NCLEX must know, must memorize that. Now, I briefly mentioned how you breathe versus, I mean, um, 
uh, I briefly mentioned that, of course, there's nerves that control muscles that do stuff. Well, remember all the stuff that, um, remember the, uh, the vagus nerve for, um, for your cardiac and for cardiac function, it was all here, a little bit south of the pons. This is your pons, right? This is the basal part of your brain. So you'll see that they have these centers, and these are your PRG, D, VRG, and DRG. And of course, pontine respiratory group because it's near your pons, right? And then your ventral respiratory group because it's in the front, right? This is like if your eyeballs were here and this is the front of your brain, your frontal, and this is your uh, occipital here. So, you know, the person's facing that way. VRG is your ventral respiratory group. And if I have a ventral respiratory group, I have a dorsal respiratory group. Now, just know and understand that all of this together will promote breathing. Okay. So it's like an all of the above thing. So know it's, if you have a basal skull fracture, or any damage to your pons in this area, uh, you're gonna have breathing and, uh, and cardiac problems. And you could see why, because these groups are directly connected to the, uh, the two muscles of here, the two muscles of, uh, of respiration, which is your diaphragm and your intercostal muscles. Now, what are your accessory respiratory muscles? They're there. These are your external uh, intercostal muscles. But once you start using your internals and you start using like, you know, your shoulders, that's a problem. And if you see anybody who's having like a really bad asthma attack or something like that, you'll see they're starting to use their shoulders and they're going to be hunched over. And that's not a good thing. Right. And that's that uh, your VRG starts doing that. OK. Um, and when you see accessory muscles of uh, respiration, that means my patient is having dyspnea or difficulty breathing, okay? And that's controlled by the VRG, normal breathing is DRG, and um, uh, your pontine respiratory group is like the main, uh, is the main um, controller of it all. Now, what, how does it know when to breathe or how fast to breathe and whatnot? Well, there are central and peripheral chemoreceptors. Now, you would think that we monitor oxygen. Nope. We monitor carbon dioxide. Okay? That's what we monitor. And if carbon dioxide goes up, I'm going to have to do what? <sighs> breathe more or breathe deeply to get that carbon dioxide out. If my carbon dioxide goes down low, that means I got a ton of oxygen. Therefore, I don't have to breathe this much. Now, another thing that also, uh, well, let me start talking about it later. Because remember, I briefly mentioned, um, well, I, I don't think I mentioned it. Um, another thing that your lungs do is acid base control. Um, it controls your uh, level of acidity and alkalinity in your blood, and it does it uh, quite ingeniously, actually. And you'll see in the real world, the majority, there's not much oxygen in atmospheric gas. It's only 21%. So, um, uh, what did I want out of this? Uh, just to show that the air you breathe isn't all oxygen. If we had a lot of oxygen, it would start destroying cells in your body and it's not good. Um, <laughs> do we need Henry's law? No, we do not. Need that for another time. Oh, here's another example right in here, right? Of gas exchange even between cells, between your alveolus and of course the red blood cell that's going to carry the oxygen. And the red blood cell also carries carbon dioxide. And of course you see here, it is facilitated by enzymes, carbonic anhydrase, okay? And you'll also notice how CO2 is related to hydrogen ion and bicarbonate. And we're gonna talk more about that in a minute. So you could see your red blood cell carries oxygen and carbon dioxide. Oxygen has to come in from the alveolus and then CO2 has to go out. Hence the term gas exchange, hence the term respiration. I like saying that, hence the term. Okay, 
and that's called internal respiratory internal respiration or and of course within the cell in the mitochondria that's uh cellular respiration you can even look at this all the red blood cell the red blood cell here is a biconcave disc and it looks like a um like a lifesaver right or a donut with a hole in the middle now there's no nucleus in the middle it's an anucleated cell but what it has in the middle is hemoglobin if you look at hemoglobin there there are a bunch of proteins that are folded up in a certain way is it just me and these are heme groups or um, iron right here, these discs? Uh, use your imagination a little bit. Doesn't it look, look like lawn chairs? And that's what helps me remember that the hemoglobin in my red blood cell, they're lawn chairs. They hold things. What, can, what are they going to hold? They're going to hold either carbon dioxide or oxygen. pH curves, again, I'm not gonna discuss it here in my lecture, but again, if ever you're taking your MCAT, please consult a physician. There's a whole bunch of them here. Uh, give them a call and ask them, what do these curves mean? Because this is definitely on your MCAT if ever, any of you wanna to go to medical school. I'm not quite sure it's on NCLEX because I don't know, I tutored my daughter for some things, and this is, wasn't one of them. Um, <clears throat> carbon dioxide, bicarbonate, uh, now, carbonic anhydrase. Bicarbonate is a buffer, okay? It is a, um, it is a weak base. And um, things like, uh, um, like carbonic acid and which is right here and uh, um, what's the other one well another buffer is a weak acid um, so there's got to be you see these arrows pointing left and right there's got to be a balance and of course the and what am I doing I'm exhaling carbon dioxide in, a, in an aqueous solution uh, which is water vapor so it's going to make Carbonic acid because of carbonic anhydrase, of course, H plus, which is a hydrogen ion. So that's an acid and bicarbonate, that's a base. And therefore it, that I have to have a balance between these two things. So how do we balance it? High altitude acclimatization, no, where is it? Oh, they're gonna not show. Nope, the filament of the lung. Nah, we don't need to know that. No, okay, we're already at the end. So I guess I have to explain it. Let us talk about uh, this topic, which I believe it's in, I think it's in, how ATP is formed. Uh, this video, of course, see when it's like that doesn't work. But we already talked about uh, we already talked about that in the previous lecture. Um, there's nice notes here, respiratory physiology notes. More notes here. These are nice, right? But the thing I want to talk about is ABGs, or arterial blood gas. Where is that video that I like? Six easy steps. Uh, let's go to YouTube. There's this one. Oh, this lady's. If you're studying for your um for your uh your um, NCLEX. Oh, she has some really neat videos. Uh, my daughter, uh, my daughter swears by her. And it was, and, and around the time, see, six years ago, uh, that's when my daughter was uh, studying for uh, her NCLEX. Well, not six years ago, but um, uh, uh, it was years ago that, uh, and they still watch it to this day. Now, where is the gentleman? 
All right, let's use her because she's nice. And also it's, it's uh, um, I, I, I like her explanations. Have you ever been at your nursing lab at your school watching your faculty demoing the skill for the day? Nope. Gas values and how to interpret that based on those values. For instance, is a patient having respiratory alkalosis or are they having metabolic alkalosis? And you have to be able to differentiate between those two and also you'll have to know whether the patient's trying to compensate or if they're partially compensated. So in nursing school, I remember having to solve these problems, and these problems gave me a lot of difficulty. But then someone showed me how to use the tic-tac-toe method. So in this video, I want to show you what the tic-tac-toe method's about, how to actually set up a problem with it, and talk to you a little bit about um, pH levels, HC3O levels, and things like that. In the next video, video, we're actually going to work these ABG problems. So be sure to check out that next video and work the videos along with me. And then after that, check out the free quiz we have on our website, registernursrn.com, and test your knowledge on ABGs along with other NCLEX quizzes and personality quizzes that we have. So first, let's talk about the tic-tac-toe method and how to use it with ABGs. First, the very first thing you want to learn before you start solving ABG problems is you need to learn the normal values because in a problem, you'll be given the pH level, you'll be given the PCO2 level, and you'll be giving, given the HCO3 level. So you need to know what the normal ranges are for people. So here are the normal ranges. I would write this down. pH level, the normal is 7.35 to 7.45. Anything over 7.45 is a base. Another word for base is alkalotic, which is alkalosis. Anything less than 7.35 is an acid, so it'd be acidotic. Um, I'm going to skip to HCO3 because it's the same. Um, 22 to 26 is your normal range for that, and that represents metabolic. So anything over 26 would be um, basic, it would be alkalotic, just like with the pH, and anything less than 22 would be an acid, so it would be alkalotic. So they would be having a metabolic problem and it would, they would be alkalotic, I mean acidotic. Okay, for the PCO2, this represents your respiratory level. Um, it's the opposite for what the pH and the HCO3 are. This a lot of times throws people off. So just remember PCO2 is opposite and it represents your respiratory. So for instance, I'm sorry, pH is the negative log of the concentration of the hydrogen ion, right? So what does that mean? I could ask you a pH question. If given the pH of my patient is 7.2, are they, are they normal, acidotic or alkalotic? And if it's over here, like, you know, to the left of 7.35, there's, it's an acid. That means they got a lot of hydrogen ion. If it's more than 7.45, my patient is alkalotic or there's a lot of base, it's too much. Now, if you notice the last two digits of uh, the pH match the PCO2, PACO2, which stands for partial pressure of the, uh, partial arterial pressure of carbon dioxide. So you have 35, to 45. So if you notice 7.35 to 7.45, the, the last two digits is 3, 5, and 4, 5. You can memor that, memorize it that way. Now, bicarbonate, which is HCO3, HCO3 minus, remember bicarbonate is a weak base. So if I don't have a lot of bicarbonate, so it's uh, less than 22, that means what? I'm acidotic. If I have too much bicarbonate, that means what? I'm alkalotic if it's greater than 26. So see it in things like either too much or too little or dead in the middle. Now, another thing you will notice that the pH or the hydrogen levels in your blood, they have two compensations. One is breathing, which is your PaCO2. Because remember, that's how you breathe. That's what we monitor in your peripheral and your um, uh, internal uh, chemoreceptors. We monitor CO2, not oxygen. That's what, that's what the body and the brain look for. And bicarbonate is of course metabolic. 
Okay, it's the chemical portions of your body that's going to react to your chemistry. So that's a beautiful question as well. What are the two compensations to uh, um, uh, pH homeostasis? Well, one's breathing, the other one's bicarb or metabolic. Breathing, metabolic. And breathing, we measure PaCO2. Metabolic, I measure um, bicarbonate or HCO3 minus. Um, in my blood. So now when you look at ABG, which is an arterial blood gas, you could see these three numbers are very, very important. Okay. So uh, uh, these are some basic questions that I could ask for your, um, uh, on your final regarding this particular topic. Going forward. Anything less than 35 is basic. So it's alkalotic. Anything over 45 is acidotic, so it's an acid. So you'll want to memorize these values because this is your baseline for whenever you're comparing your problem that you're given to how to set up the problem. So I would write that down, like I said, before you actually start working your problems. Next, let's go over the actual setting up for the tic-tac-toe method. As you see, this looks like a basic little tic-tac-toe. You know, whenever you used to play with your friends, you would set up the tic-tac-toe like that, and someone would be O's, another person would be X's, and you would play like this, and oh, you got tic-tac-toe. We're not really using the X's and O's. We're gonna throw that concept out, but we are keeping the concept of lining something up with the threes, in, in a row of threes. So for our grid, for the tic-tac-toe grid, we've automatically gonna put acid, normal, base. And this is easy how it's set up. Anything for the pH or the HCO3, and remember anything that's less than the normal value is an acid, and anything greater than that value is a base, except for respiratory. Remember, PaCO2 is the opposite. So let's just work a problem so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, in this problem, the patient's pH. Now it's at this point that we're going beyond the scope of this particular class, but we're going to continue with this video because um, this is the one question that um, your professors, uh, uh, for those of you, uh, I believe the majority of you are in nursing, in your pathology class that you guys get wrong like all the time. And also when they did analysis of, um, of you know, uh, high value uh, NCLEX uh, questions, EBG interpretation or ABG misinterpretation was in the top five. So the questions that I asked before, that's typically on my exam, but these things going forward are things that, you know, you really should be exposed to prior to, uh, you know, your pathology and your other classes. All right, moving on. Is 7.23. Their P... ACO2, which represents respiratory, is 50, and their HCO3 is 30. And remember, HCO3 represents metabolic. Okay, after you've set up... I'm muted, sorry. So right now, could I give a problem like this? I could ask. My patient has a pH of 7.23. Are they acidotic or alkalotic? Give me an answer. PACO2 is 50. Is that normal? No, it's too much. Too much CO2. Um, well, I'm not going to get into that. Just know that it's what? Abnormal. It's beyond the scope of 35 to 45. HCO3 is 30. It's too much. Okay. So that's abnormal as well. your tic-tac-toe, you wrote acid, normal, and base up at the top, you're going to look at your pH. It's 7.3. So remember, normal pH is 7.35 to 7.45. So it's 7.23, so that would make it an acid. So under acid, we're going to write pH. Okay, now we're going to look at PaCO2, and remember, that represents respiratory. It's 50, and looking at our normal, PaCO2 normals are 35 to 45. So since it's 50, remember it's the opposite for a rest. Now you could 
try to memorize that like it's the opposite but let's let's look at it like in a non memorization way in an understanding co2 is what happens when i exhale right that's what i'm trying to get rid of i inhale oxygen i try to get rid of uh a co2 by exhaling now one of the reasons why i'm getting rid of co2 is because remember that formula carbonic anhydrase what it's also doing is it also has a lot of hydrogen ions in it so if i have a lot of hydrogen ions in my blood i'm going to start breathing more <laughs> That means I'm also going to start exhaling more. If I exhale more, that means I'm acidotic. I am trying to get rid of CO2. And no one understand that because of carbonic anhydrase, CO2 and, and, and the hydrogen ion and H plus are linked together. And that's what I'm trying to do when I'm breathing. And that's why, you know, if you're new at running or new at um, any cardiovascular exercise, that's why you get crampy because you have a buildup of hydrogen ion in your muscles and then you start becoming acidotic and then it becomes not fun right so that's what she means by like when you say opposite so if it's the number if the paco2 is increased that means think acidotic if the paco2 is decreased think alkalotic and for the reason that i just gave Tori it is an ass it's going to be an acid not a base it's an acid so our paco2 is acidic so under that we're going to put paco2 and always solve your problem before you start doing your crosses because we need to know how our metabolic fits into this because this is going to tell us if we're compensating or not so always put all your values in before you cross down in your three letters so the HCO3 is 30. Normal HCO3 is 22 to 26. So it's 30. So because it's greater than 26, it's basic. So they're alkalotic. So under base, we're going to write HCO3. Now we already have our tic-tac-toe. And looking at this, you know that this patient, because we have three in a row, this is where you're going to interpret if it's respiratory or metabolic. PaCO2, what does it represent? Respiratory. So we know that we have a respiratory issue. Now, for instance, let me just throw this out here. If these two values were switched, say HCO3 was over here and PaCO2 was under base, because we got the cross underneath here, that would be a metabolic problem instead of a respiratory problem. So we have respiratory. Hey guys, welcome to Forward. We're a new type of doctor's office that's providing right. preventative. Let's break right here. So you could see how this is, uh, well, the way I was trained is whoever matches the pH, that's what the problem is. So you could see here, we discovered that the PaCO2 is acidotic. The pH is acidotic. So they match. That means, and remember CO2, that means it's a respiratory problem. And you could see who's the outlier, who's sticking out there, HCO3. So you have respiratory acidosis with a metabolic compensation. And that's the kind of questions you'll have on your NCLEX and your MCAT. Um, and this is just a little introduction. And I'll have this, um, this um, and you could look at a, a, ABG's Made Easy. I'll also have this, um, but my questions won't go to that to this level. My questions will only ask about single things. Um, but you could see how uh, in the future, how your exams will be more about asking about pull, pulling all the data together and then uh, and then presenting it. And as a future clinicians and future nurses, you should be able to do this. Um, and it gets, sometimes it gets a little bit more complicated. But there are again practice 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 oh here's another fluid and electrolytes this is another thing junior nurses and junior doctors mess up on a daily basis and it's scary uh um i used to i used to make i used to make uh patients hypernatremic like all day and uh oh it was so stressful but you live you learn then you stop doing stupid things so what's due next week, of course, 
And of course, and here's, uh, we have it on tape. And a reminder, next week we are on campus, 9 a.m. Tuesday, what was it? November 30th, I think is next week, 9 a.m. on campus. Uh, we'll, um, those of you who um, uh, have uh, already done um, the heart dissection, uh, you don't have to come, but there's a, there is a presentation at 10 a.m. by uh, Career Services. Um, so uh, please stay for that because a lot of things about how to get a job, even though you already have a job, but how to get the bigger, fatter, better job, not a lot of people get to talk about until it's too late. Um, and uh, um, Mr. Metcalf, who's uh, part of our career services team, uh, will be here. And also there are job opportunities. Many of you have been working in the same facility for 10 years. Yeah, it's good and all, but if, if you didn't make supervisor yet, uh, go find another place. Um, uh, um, those of you also medical assistant, I was a medical assistant for four years. That's three years way too long. Um, there are other things. And the only way to do that is through what kind of marketing do you do for yourself? What kind of uh, networking do you do? What does your resume, what does your cover letter look like? Right. So these are the things that uh, Mr. Metcalf will be talking about next week at 10 a.m. And so uh, if you come in at nine, we'll do uh, the hard stuff. Then we'll uh, put away the hard stuff for a little bit and then take a break and uh, um, uh, talk to Mr. Metcalf. So if you've uh, if you've already did the heart dissection, don't have to come. But or if you want to come and start on the pig dissection um, that you already did the heart dissection, um, be my guest. I, I can put you in the back as well. Um, uh, all are welcome. But um, make sure if you cannot make it, I repeat, if you cannot make it, I need a formal email explaining to me why so I can put it on record that uh, you you declined to come to lab. All right. Um, but uh, so far, uh, things have been working out on both sides. So I, I think it's for the best. So what's due next week, task seven, discussion seven. Uh, again, technology, look into lung. 2021 stuff, please. Also, I've been fielding, uh, not necessarily from your class, I've been fielding stuff like people are looking at like, you know, dot com websites or blogs. Try to get, get away from that because that's more opinion than actual medical fact. And uh, that's what we're looking for. So uh, we're looking, like, uh, we're looking for like uh, technology. And telemetry now has been using iPhone for more than 10 years. So, and telehealth has, grown immensely because of uh, the pandemic. So, um, and not only benefits, okay? Be the, be the growing pessimist that I am. Um, also talk about the bad things. Um, I'm the, the data for telehealth is good, but a lot of people are going back to the normal visits. Well, at least in this area, according to my wife is, uh, she works for Inova and she does patient access. So they, they have the data on how many people are requesting to do online stuff and, and uh, how many people are uh, wanting to see the doctor uh, uh, um, uh, in person. A lot of people, there's a growing dissension now in this, in the DMV that they don't like, uh, they don't like the online platforms as much as uh, actually going and speaking to the doctor. Even though you're speaking to the doctor and or the nurse in real time, face to face, being the camera, a lot of people, uh, you know, they want the personal touch. And also, this is my thing. How can I do a physical examination on looking at you, looking at you uh, in a camera? Uh, I, I always had patients tell me like, oh, it's a scam. You're trying to get money off of me. No, I need to see you. This, it goes, if I don't need to see you as much, I, I'll tell you. But uh, when I was practicing, I need to physically see you. Um, but again, it's the challenges with COVID and all that stuff. Um, so that's discussion and make sure you answer only one person, but answer, uh, again, I don't think it's this class, but uh, if it's you and I put that comment and you're saying stuff like, hey, Susan, this is a really great post. I learned a lot. Okay. What did you learn? And can you add to it? Okay. Let's say, for example, I found this really great technology that doesn't even require the phone and you don't have to log in, blah, 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 blah. Right. Then you talk about all the wonderful things that it does. Well, how's this? Why don't you find all the bad things? 
and state that, let's say, for example, Susan, I agree with your post. Telehealth has a lot of great things to offer, but I found this 2021 NIH article that tells me that uh, medical errors have gone up because of telehealth. Okay, so you, you respectfully what? Adding to the conversation, right? Instead of, I, I don't know about you guys, I'm not a very social person. And one of the reasons why I'm not a social person, because I have a very sensitive BS meter. So when you ever go to parties or stuff and you don't really know everybody, and then they're like, hey, how's the weather? Does that, does that contribute to your life whatsoever? And that's what it sounds like when you guys do those posts. Like, hey, I learned a lot. No, no, you didn't, right? Show us, show me, right? Take it to the next, to the next, uh, uh, to the next level, um, because um, and and this is not the only university I see it. My students at Mason do the same exact thing, um, uh, and it's um, that's not education, and it's also not the way to have an academic conversation. So please, please, please look for evidence. Dig, dig a little deeper, right? Um, what's the case study look like for this week? Click on it, download the case. Mystery, cellular respiration. Okay, so this is a cellular respiration problem. Section one, part one, part two, part three, part four. Yeah, there's not too many questions, all parts. And let's look at the questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're pretty straightforward. Okay. Yeah. Yep, it's pretty straightforward. I don't see anything really bizarre. All right. So on that note, you guys have your marching orders for next week. If there and it's at this portion of the show, I will stop recording. <laughs>